Never a dull moment here, nor Kenton. Uh, we forgot, I forgot to tell John about addition to the announcement for the Cleveland uh, fundraiser. All the information is on the, uh, that you'll need is over here on the table. Uh, what you need to bring if you want to participate in the donations or the purchasing, you need to uh, send in your payment. Envelopes, self address, they're already addressed. Everything's on the table. So if you have any questions, just go to the table. You know, as I was in the room over here getting ready to come in here, my, uh, my granddaughter said short sermon. So her parents are training her already. Well, today we're going to conclude the series, A Congregation of God. And up to this point, as you recall, we have looked at the joy. The joy of the blessings that God has given us to be here. It's more than just service. There's got to be something behind that service. There's got to be that understanding of what it means to love the brethren. What does it mean to love the truth? And we talked about also the last part of when it's threatened. Are we the ones threatening? Or if something else is trying to influence us or, or make its way into this, this house, do we notice it? Do we fight for it? Do we sigh and do we cry? Because it should be important to us to know why we do what we do and have this investment, this precious pearl that we really hold dear. Why are we here is very important. Thinking of the legacy that we're going to leave and how it should hurt us. It should hurt us each individually when something disrupts what we have. It's a special, again, a special and unique culture. But what we're going to do today, as I promised, you know, we talked about how it can upset us, and then God is angry when he sees us not taking advantage of what he gives us and holding it precious. But I want to look at it from God's perspective, as we, as we talked about. What could we be doing? Why is these warnings keep coming forth? And why God keeps telling us, beware, therefore, stay alert, watch. Have that sense of urgency because he says, it not only affects you, it affects me. It hurts me. And he wants us to know why. Why he feels that way. In a few moments, we're going to go through that major prophecy that we talked about last time in Ezekiel 8. Because it's a prequel to what we did read in Ezekiel 9.34 about that sighing and crying. Noticing that, you know, it destroys us. And it makes God back away. Because this prophecy will talk about that warning. It will speak to God sighing and crying for his own people. It will reveal the truth, because he loves us so much, he will give us the truth, and he wants us to know what it means to refuse, to not only know him, but what will happen when we lose the value of what it means to be his holy people. We read it last time in the Proverbs, where it says, you know, where there's no vision, the people perish. And God says, I don't want you on that path. I don't want you on that path, and I don't want you to lose the vision ever. I don't want your human nature to get the best of you. I want my nature to overcome that nature. I don't want the influences of this world to be stronger than what I have given you, what my son died for. But before we dive in this section, I want us, as I mentioned last time, it's so easy to look and say, that's just a prophecy for Israel. That's just a prophecy for them. But I want us to take note, this is not just a singularity. This has duality, and it goes far-reaching. So when we read this prophecy, just like we read in Ezekiel 9, God really points. He says, this is not happening around you. These things are happening within you. When we hear those terms about the temple, we hear the terms about Jerusalem, we hear these terms, we got to understand, God said, I am talking to you. Those shadows that were mentioned in the Old Testament are pointing to you. All that happened for your learning and the end of the age has come. And if you don't grasp it, you're going to miss what I'm trying to get your attention with. In your own study, we don't have time to go through it as much, but go back and what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 6 and 2 Corinthians 6, where he says, you are the body, the temple, a temple that holds my Holy Spirit, the temple of the living God. 
And in Ephesians chapter 2, Paul says your fellow citizens, citizens of a country, a place, part of a foundation in whom the called the habitation of God's Spirit. David wrote about this often in Psalms where he says, I chose Judah, Mount Zion, which I love. It's not just a physical place, but the people. I chose even you. He goes on to say in Psalm 125, those who trust in the Lord are as Mount Zion. That symbology is, is so important. Even Zechariah talks about rejoice, you daughters of Zion. You daughters of Jerusalem, we have the, a time to rejoice when we see what we have. Because God, remember the other Proverbs we covered was when God gives us blessings, it makes us wealthy and he adds no sorrow to it. So if the sorrow is there, he's saying, heed my warning, it should be joy. So rejoice, you who have such great things. And if we want to look into the future, when John was asked, do you want to see the bride? Do you want to see a picture of bride, the bride whom Christ is going to marry? What vision did he see? The holy city. That temple. That temple whom we're built on. These warnings, these blessings are so important to us because God gave them first to a physical nation because they were to set an example. They were to be the ones on this earth to say they're different. No matter what goes on around them, that's a people who definitely know who they are. They have a God who leads them and they dedicate their lives to please Him and He watches over them. They stand as a symbol. And what a great honor. We look at it today. We are a chosen people who were not once a people but have been chosen to proclaim something, to be just as they were, a modeled nation, a nation who models itself after God, after what He wants, His standards of holiness, not modeling ourselves after what's around us. They should want to be as we are and not us as they are. That's what God says. Know why. Invest in understanding that why. Sigh and cry when it's threatened, because I do. I do. Remember, we talked about Jesus looking at Jerusalem and just crying out how often I wanted to hold you and pull you in as a hen does her chicks. But you won't let me. So when we consider these important things that we've covered up this point. It should be evident God is just in his anger when he sees his children turning their backs, when he sees us forgetting, ignoring, blatantly walking away to who we are and that great potential that he has revealed to us. Because he knows the wealth that we are walking away from. An eternity that our minds can't even be wrapped around. He knows what we're doing. If you would please to start this out, let's just turn to 1 Corinthians just to set the tone of who we are in relation to why it's so important to understand when he calls us out, when we're doing something wrong. He's not the God who's an ogre just waiting to shoot us with a lightning bolt. He sends us warnings, a gentle nudges. He loves us enough, as we talked a lot in the past, he loves us enough to tell us the truth. But Paul, writing to a, a very dysfunctional church, and I saw this on Facebook, if Paul's alive today, there would be a, book, a letter written to us and it would fit nicely in this Bible. But listen what Paul says here in 1 Corinthians 3, pick it up verse 9. For we are God's fellow workers. Paul's speaking about the, the leadership. You are God's field. You. You are important. It's, you're not just those who send tithes in or just... Come and listen to a guy speak. No, we're part of something bigger. Like I said, think big. Think like God. For you are God's field. You are God's building. Verse 11. 
for no other foundation can anyone lay. There's nothing else that anyone could ever present that could come out of this world than what has been revealed to you. Nothing can anyone lay that which has been laid, and that's Jesus Christ. No one can reinterpret or try to make it work other than what Christ voiced, what he gave. And if anyone builds on this foundation, be it with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw, each one's work would become manifest. It would become evident. It won't be hidden. You can't do things in dark. We're going to see that being talked about in this prophecy. Drop down to verse 16. Do you not know? As I mentioned this earlier, but I wanted to read this one in particular. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells within you? You are something special. You have something special. You have an identity that is set apart. You should look. You should act. You should become something different. But again, here's a warning. If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. And it's just. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are of. Verse 23. And you are Christ. Remember we talked about bought with a very high price. You are Christ. And Christ is God's. Very, very important way to look at ourselves. So with that in mind, let's turn back to that prophecy in Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 8. What I want to do is I want to read through it first, then we're going to break it down. We're going to break it down into three points. And those three points are going to be the mind, the heart, and the hand. And if you want a title to this last part of the Congregation of God series, that will serve as a title. The mind, the heart, and the hand. Chapter 8, verse 1 of the book of Ezekiel. And I apologize, I have a bad habit of interjecting the name Isaiah from time to time. We are talking about Ezekiel today. We will go possibly to the other chapters, other books in the Bible. But if I say that, no, that's just my mistake. Chapter 8, verse 1. And it came to pass in the sixth year and the sixth month on the fifth day of the month, as I sat in my house with the elders of Judah sitting before me, that the hand of the Lord God fell upon me there. Then I looked, and there was a likeness like the appearance of fire from the appearance of his waist downward. Fire from his waist and upward like the appearance of brightness, like the color of amber. It's like then, when God reveals himself, it's not common. He comes in a higher standard. It should grab our attention. This is something that needs Ezekiel's full attention. And he says, he stretched out the form of a hand. He took me by the lock of the hair. And the Spirit lifted me up between earth and heaven. He brought me in visions of God to Jerusalem, to the door of the north gate of the inner, north, inner court, where the seat of the image of jealousy was, which provokes jealousy. And behold, the glory of the God of Israel was there, like the visions that I saw in the plain. And then he said to me, son, a son of man, Lift your eyes now toward the north. So I lifted my eyes toward the north. And there, north of the altar gate, was the image of jealousy in the entrance. Furthermore, he said to me, Son of man, do you see what they are doing? Do you see what's happening in this special place? The great abominations that the house of Israel commits here to make me go far away from my sanctuary you remember in chapter 9, in verse 3, it says, he noticed that God says, that I'm, it's done, I'm backing away. Because there's about to be judgment. So he says, they're doing this. And it will make me want to go far away from here. He says, now though, I want to show you something else. Now turn again, you will see even greater abominations. You think that's bad, and we're going to go in more detail. But I just want to read through there. I want to show you some greater abomination. So he brought me to the door of the court. And when I looked, there was a hole in the wall. Then he said to me, son of man, dig into the wall 
there's this hidden thing. They're trying to hide something, so dig it out. And when he dug it into the wall, there was a door. And he said to me, go in and see the wicked abominations which they are doing there. So I went in and saw there every sort of creeping thing, abominable beast, and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed all around on the walls. And there stood before them 70 men of the elders of the house of Israel. And in the midst stood Jezaniah, the son of Shaphan. Each man had a censer in his hand, and a thick cloud of incense went up. And then he said to me, Son of man, have you seen what the elders of the house of Israel do in the dark? Every man in the room of his own idols? For they say, and they really believe this, almost is what he's saying, the Lord does not see us. You see, the Lord has forsaken the land. And he said to me, there is more. Turn again, and you will see greater abominations that they are doing. So he brought me to the door of the north gate of the Lord's house. And to my dismay, there were women who were sitting there weeping for Tammuz, the Babylonian god, all the way back from what they were supposed to be brought out of. Now it's there, they're worshiping. Then he said to me, have you seen this, old son of man? It gets worse. Turn again, you will see greater abominations than even this. So he brought me into the inner courts of the Lord's house. And there, a door of the temple of the Lord, at the door of the temple of the Lord. Between the porch and the altar were about 25 men with their backs. Now get this, we're going to go in more detail here later. With their backs toward the temple of the Lord. And they were worshiping the sun toward the east. And he said to me, have you seen this, O son of man? Is it a trivial thing to the house of Judah to commit these abominations which they commit here? For they have filled the land with violence. They have returned to provoke me to anger. Indeed, they put the branch in their nose. And therefore, I will act in fury. My eye will not spare, nor will I have pity. And though they cry my, in, in my ears with a loud voice, I will not hear them. That's a strong, strong word. Strong word coming through in this prophecy. Should be a piercing of our heart. Should be to us today. Words of Nathan as we talked about. But do we have the heart of David to let this shake us? Because God says, if you don't love what you do, if you don't understand why, and you don't see what's going on, and be that people who stand in the gap, say no, this is what God says. There is a path God sees it going toward. It will happen. Let's back up. Again, we talked about this in chapter, in verse 1, when, when he talks about who is given this message. That sense of awe. That sense of awe. Do we still, under this point one, the mind. Under this point one, as we start breaking this down, the mind. When God speaks, when God reveals himself to us with this word, do we still stand in awe of him? Do we recognize holiness in comparison to the profane, the common? Does it still grab our attention? Because there's things that will try to enter our mind to desensitize us, to make us numb, so that we can't differentiate between what God said do and what the world says is popular. Satan knows how to appeal to the senses. And the one, the first thing he gets us with is the eyes. What we allow, the doorway into our mind. And that's exactly what we start seeing here. In verse 3, remember it says, he stretched out the form of his hand. He took me by the lock of the hair and said, I'm going to, you're going to see this. And you're going to notice these things. So he lifted me up, he said, between heaven and earth. He brought me visions to, of Jerusalem to the door of the north gate of the inner court. Do you anybody know what takes place at the north gate? 
where they brought in the animals for sacrifice. It's where the sacrifices would take place. An important aspect of how we approach our God as those living sacrifice. But then he says, but a way that was supposed to teach you of me, pointing to what God is doing, what Christ would come to do. You took something precious, and now there stands something there, I am provoked to jealousy. An image, he goes on to say. That's why he says, back, we won't, we won't have time to go there, but remember we covered this year back in Deuteronomy 12. What was those instructions when you come into the land? Remove those high places. Cut down those groves. Remove, burn, destroy all those things in which they worship their gods. And once it's destroyed, don't even seek to try to understand it. Don't, don't, don't look at it and don't, because I know you. It will capture your senses. It will go in through your eyes. It will enter into your mind. That's why God says, we got to stay on top of this. You've got to be careful what you yield, what you allow to come in before me. It will take you. It will, you will begin to sacrifice to it. You will lose the vision of me, and you will be on that road that will lead to perishing because you won't have that vision anymore. That vision that he wanted to, you know, turn back to chapter 7 of Deuteronomy. I have it in my notes here, and I want to read that. What is that vision and why he, he says this? That image is, is a stirring to jealousy. It's provoking him to jealousy because you're forgetting something so important here. Instead of sacrificing to me, you allow your mind to have something else stand in front of it. You, you no longer see the importance of removing these things. That image is most likely an asterisk, which is just a carbon image. That which was supposed to have been destroyed. Chapter 7, look at verse 6. For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God chose you to be a people for Himself, a special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. The Lord did not set His love on you, nor choose you because you were more in number than any other people, for you are the least of these people. But because the Lord loves you and because He would keep the oath which He swore to your fathers, this reaches beyond you. This is reaching to the legacy that you're part of. You're not even looking back to the tree. You put your own tree there now. He goes, it's because I swore to your fathers and the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand. Remember, it goes back to when they're standing before the mountain and I am the Lord your God. Nothing else matters. you got to remember this. Teach this to your children. Keep it perpetual. I redeemed you from the house of bondage, from that hand of Pharaoh of Egypt. Therefore, know that the Lord, your God, He, He deserves your sacrifices. He deserves your attention. He is the vision. And if you lose it, you will perish. And that hurts God to see us do that. He is God. And he goes on to say, He is the faithful God who keeps His covenant with those whom He loves and keep His commandment. God says, it can happen. It has happened. And it hurts. See, it hurts me to see this. And yes, I stir to anger. And that does take correction. But it should hurt you to realize what you're doing to me. This secular culture cannot be reflected in your lives. God says, remember who you are. Reflect holiness. Reflect me. And the only way you're going to do is if it's in, my, in your mind. If it's the apple of your eye. The gateway to who you are, your senses, is always focused on me. And when God is that sinner, it keeps us in contact. It keeps us in remembrance of the oath we made with him.
a covenant. And when we keep our mind focused, it gives a clear understanding, no matter what is presented in this world, our God is the only God. We know and we seek to be known. And he is the only one that deserves our sacrifices. We don't have time to turn there, but in Romans 2, remember, what is your reasonable service? We present ourselves as living sacrifices, holy, acceptable, and pleasing to our God. Not with graven images, not with what we want. In fact, Jesus says in Matthew 6, verses 22, around that area, in that section, where your treasure is, your heart will follow. Where you put your focus, your heart will indeed follow. That's why he says you cannot just let anything into your life. First Corinthians 15, uh, thir- no, it's 15.33. Evil company will corrupt good habits. God gave us something to teach us how to live. And that holiness is our standard. We practice it. We engage. We dive into the deeper spiritual intent so that when someone tries to interject something or try to convince us, we're like, nope. That doesn't take place in this temple. This won't take place on this altar. This altar is giving sacrifices that are holy, that are acceptable, that direct straight to God, and nothing comes in between. I guard I guard. You know, one of the when way Paul started his letter to the Galatians, just like he would start one to us at times. I marvel. I marvel how you're so quickly turned if we're not focused. We don't want that letter written to the, the church in America saying, I gave you the blessings of Abraham. Opportunities to show them what sacrifices should be given. And you chose to put an asterisk in my altar, in your life. So no longer you're living for me or sacrifice for me. You, you're sacrificing something else. Which, again, if you turn back to Ezekiel 8, he goes on to say in the last part of verse 6, again, he goes, but you think that's bad? Let's show you more. It gets worse. Let me show you how this this turning of your mind, how it affects you much more than what you realize. And that's what we're talking about. Point two here is it will get into your heart. It will get into places where you think, oh no, no one would know. You can hide it all you want. In fact, as we read in verse 7, he said he brought him into that, into that door of the court. And there was this little hole in the wall, a little speck that shouldn't be there. And he goes, you've got to dig that out. As if they're trying to hide something there. We can't hide our hearts. And he digs it out and he says, do you see what's in here? Under point two of the heart. There's something going on. Because something now has become between me and my people... It is changing who they are. So much so, they think they can hide it from me. Holiness no longer is held as that precious pearl in their lives. They now go and put something else in their heart. Starting to reveal their true nature, their character, who they truly are. A place where they think no one else can see. In fact, Luke chapter 12. Christ actually talks about this. In Luke 12, verse 2, Luke 12, verse 2, says, For there is nothing covered that won't be revealed, nothing hidden that will not be known. Therefore, whatever you have spoken in the dark, you can hide it all you want. You can't hide it from God. You can't hide it in His house. He says, It will be heard in the light. What you spoke in the ear in the inner rooms, 
no matter how hard you tried to hide that door, will be proclaimed on the housetop. So he's saying, you get to the point where you openly and blatantly put something before me, and then you convince yourself that you can hide it from me. And then he goes on, he lists these things, these great abominations. So this thing defined what was in the what you're supposed to clear out now. Yeah, you let an idol start the process, but then it started to build. So much so now you turn to what was supposed to keep you holy. And now you've let that defile you, and it, now that's defining you. You do it in the secret too. But listen what they said. Remember, the Lord does not see us. The Lord has forsaken the land. Now they believe their own lie. They've fallen for their own narrative. God said, that's not what I called you to do. In fact, in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 3, No matter what we have to face, we speak truth. Chapter 6, verse 3. We give no offense in anything that our ministry may not be blamed. But in all things, we commend ourselves as ministers of God in much patience and tribulations and needs and distresses and stripes, imprisonments, tumults, labors, sleeplessness and fastings by purity. We don't let anything abominable come into our midst. We don't let... Our situations convince us who our God is. He's the same God today, yesterday, today, and forever. He deserves purity. So they do it in purity by the knowledge. By the knowledge that He gave us. We don't forget those words. It was an effort to put God in our heart. Why would we surrender it to something else? By kindness. By the Holy Spirit. Because we realize holiness, God's presence is more important than that which the world presents, no matter what, how they present it, by sincere love, the nature of God, by the word of truth, not what is exciting, what makes people feel good. No, truth, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left, we keep guard. We keep a watch. We don't make excuses. We keep a sense of urgency. By honor. Dishonor. No matter if people want to honor us or they try to make us look bad. That don't get us down. We know who stands with us. We know who we stand with. Even by with their evil reports or good reports. We don't let that get us down. And we don't let someone try to puff us up to think we're bigger than we are. Our standard is the fullness of the stature of Jesus Christ. Not the world. Then he goes on to list some more things about these things don't bother us. These things, we, we have a focus on what God has called us to. And he goes on to say in verse 11, he ends this, Oh, Corinthians, we have spoken openly to you. We don't do things in hidden darkness. Our heart is wide open. Nothing to hide. Not ashamed of who we are. We're not ashamed to lay it out before God so that if there is something wrong, we want to be corrected. It's that important to us. But notice what, back in chapter 8, notice this verse 11. They're surrounded by all these things, and before they said this, the Lord doesn't see us, the Lord has forsaken us. Notice who's in the midst, these 70 men, who's in the midst of them? Jezaniah, Jezaniah. Son of Shaphan. Use this important sign here. His name means the eternal hears. Just what we read in Luke 12. What we read in Luke 12, what was it, verses 2 and 3. No matter what we think, God can hear. God sees. And he stands as a symbol that God is there. He sees the intents of the heart. Even when we think we're doing a good job at hiding it. In your own study, you know this one very well. 2 Samuel 17, 6. Proverbs 15, 3 speaks of that. 
is Paul. We look at what he wrote. Everything we do has to come from the pure standpoint from our heart. And Ephesians 6, you don't have to turn there, verse 6, he says we don't do these things. We, not with eye service, not as men pleasers, but because we serve the great God who brought us out of bondage, who deserves holy, acceptable sacrifices. He is our focus. He has our attention. My heart desires for his law to be written upon, his law written upon. So when I do his work, I don't do it in secret and try to do my ways. No, I don't do it with eye service as men pleasers, but as a servant of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. God's will trumps my personal desires. I align my will with God. It's that important to me. But then you see a progression continue. We jump back to chapter 8 of Ezekiel. God says, you think that's bad, as we mentioned earlier? He goes, it gets worse. Let me show you what happens when you allow something to come into your mind. Let me show you what happens when it takes residence in your heart. Let me show you what happens when the holiness now does not define you, but defilement, abominations, the nations that are around you. When that becomes your identity, no longer me, let me show you that progression. It gets worse. Greater things will take place. And he goes on to say, he brought me to that north gate, verse 14, and there they were sitting, these women, weeping for Tammuz. All the way, they're engulfed. Now they are attached to this Babylonian system. We know this system is coming back. It's here. We know it's restrained at a, for some time for what it can do. But when we don't get a control of our mind, we don't get a control of our heart, it will change how we do things. It will change how we look at God. We will eventually not even resemble Him. In fact, this makes me think about when you think about the hand. It goes all the way back to the first son mentioned in the Bible. Remember Cain and Abel? When one kept his mind focused on the truth and what God wanted, and he let his heart be pure, he brought a righteous sacrifice. God, it was acceptable. But one let something else control his mind, something enter into his heart. And he brought something that was not acceptable before God, and it ate him up. It changed him, and he killed his brother. This is what Matthew Henry says about this. He says, The offerings of Cain and Abel were different. Cain showed a proud, unbelieving heart. Therefore, he and his offerings were rejected. Abel came as a sinner. He recognized what he was doing. He needed this. It was a purpose. It was helping him. And he did it according to God's appointment. And by his sacrificing, expressing humility, sincerity, and believing obediently, thus seeking the benefits of the new covenant of mercy through the promised seed, his sacrifice had a token that God accepted. Abel offered in faith. Cain did not. Then he goes on to say this. is this symbolism. In all the ages, there have always been two sorts of worshipers. Those such as Cain and those such as Abel. Namely, proud, hardened, despisers of the gospel method of salvation who attempt to please God in in their own ways, of their own devisings, and those who are humble, Believers who draw near to him in the way he has revealed. Cain indulged malignant anger against his brother Abel. He harbored an evil spirit of discontent and rebellion against God. You see, God notices all our sinful passions and discontentments. There is not an angry, envious, or fretful look that escapes his observing eye. Why is God upset with us and why does it hurt Him? Because what we allow to capture our mind will enter into our heart. It will start to be seen in point three of our hands. How we treat each other. 
how we treat our God, how we look at holiness. We start to say, I know how to worship God. I want to do it what makes me feel good. I want to do it according to my own ways. It will change who we are. Angry. Proud. Blasphemers. Those as such will not inherit king, the kingdom of God. You think that hurts our father to look at his children when he says, I can't have you in my house? Think of your own children. What if you had to tell your children, get out of my house? It would crush us. But it gets worse. It gets worse. Finally, God shows them in verse 15 and verse 16, the end result of all these things, continuing in the hand. He says, I want to show you even verse 15, those greater abominations than these. And he brought me to the inner court. The inner court where only the priest could go. Priests. Like you, the privilege to come into the inner court of the temple, to boldly come because of Christ. He goes, but I want you to see what these priests are doing. He says, you see these 25 men? What's facing what? They have their backs toward me. When they should be, as those elders, picture that we see in Revelation, before God, and those casting their crowns, bowing down to that God, worshiping, giving Him the adoration, the sacrifices that are due to Him. So grateful and humble adoration. This is our God, our Christ. No. They got their backs toward me. They've allowed all this system to turn them away from me. Now they serve in Babylonian gods and now they have only, they're not even seeking repentance. They have actually turned their backs toward me and then they're turned toward the east in worshiping the Babylonian system. They're following something. Don't think that hurts God. John 12. John 12, verse 26. God says, Christ says, excuse me. John 12, verse 20. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. Not his own reasoning, not his own ways, because it will lead you away from me. There is only one way, truth, and life. He who serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, that there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my father will honor. That's not what we see taking place in that, in that scenario. Their actions, their reverence was no longer directed toward God. No longer saw the importance of following, hearing that word, follow me. They followed self. They followed what's been presented. And it pulled them away from God. We see this happening. In fact, you can turn back to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah spoke about this. Isaiah 1, verse 2. I want to start reading for sake of time. Isaiah 1, verse 2. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth. For the Lord has spoken, I have nourished and brought up children, and they rebelled against me. The ox knows its owner, the donkey, even the donkey, these animals, these, what would we say, these dumb animals who don't have my spirit, who I give life, they don't have what you have, this reasoning. See, they know their own master's crib, but Israel does not know. My people don't consider. 
A lost sinful nation. A people laden with iniquity. A brood of evildoers. Children who are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked to anger the Holy One of Israel. And they have turned away backward. Chapter 3. Verse 8. For Jerusalem stumbled. Judah is fallen. Why? Because their tongue and their doing. It's against the Lord to provoke the eyes of His glory. The look on their countenance witnesses against them. And they declare their sin as Sodom. That's who we are. We're going to put a Asterisk right here at the side. We're going to sacrifice that. That's my attention. And then it becomes, what's in my heart? I don't, I, God don't, God's not here anymore. Surround myself with everything abominable. Weep for the Babylonian way. Worship the Babylonian way. So much so I declare it as a sin as Sodom. Then it gets on to say, they do not hide it. No longer will it be hidden in a door. It's going to be just proclaimed openly. Woe to their soul, for they have brought evil upon themselves. Very important to know what can happen. But I want you to turn to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. I'm going to really speed up here. Romans 1. And we think about what we're dealing with in this world. But I want you to think about this. As we read, it's not just what's happening in the world. Remember, they were told it's happening in your midst. Often we go to chapter, uh, the first chapter in Romans. We want to jump straight to verse 26 and talk about the homosexuality and all this stuff going on around us today. We want to fight the sickening things that we see unfolding for us. But those verses are not the beginning of the scenario. You see, the vile way of life we see is proclaiming their sins of Sodom. We're actually talking about a people who knew the truth. People who actually let go of the truth. People who decide now to worship something else. People who decide to be the abomination. People who turn their backs. You know, the story begins back in verse 16. That's just another step. In verse 16, it says, For I am not ashamed, Paul says, of the gospel of Christ. I love this truth. This is, he revealed, he called me out of that bondage and he revealed something to me. I'm not ashamed to be different. I'm not ashamed to walk contrary. I want to be a holy temple unto my Lord. I want to build and be built upon. For it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also the Greek. I see the value in it. Holy. And I want to be part of that. For it is in the righteousness of the God. Is, for, it is, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith. The faith is written. The just shall live by faith. I want to listen to every word that proceeds from his mouth. Even though it might be hard. I'm going to walk it. I'm going to live it. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all. And here's where we start to see it. Against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth, who know the truth and yet try to suppress it, try to pervert it, and try to teach others to do the same. That's not what God means. I know you've been doing it for years. God won't, God's be okay with this. No, it starts with what we allow to enter our mind. Will we let something else be set upon this altar and not sacrifice to God? holy and acceptable, but now to something else. It starts back there. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. He's already shown what is acceptable, what is expected of you, old man. You know what God expects. For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. Even His eternal power in Godhead, you're without excuse. I revealed myself to you. I covenanted with you. You covenanted with me. I revealed my heart to you. And I laid it all out. And you agreed. But, although they knew God, they did not keep that sense of awe. 
They didn't glorify Him as God. Nor were they thankful. But it started in their mind. They became futile in their thoughts. It went to their heart. They became foolish in their hearts. They were darkened. They tried to hide. They tried, and they started putting all these abominable things. saying, God is not here. God don't care. We got it figured out. They professed to be wise. They set themselves up. They didn't leave the temple. They redesigned the temple. But they became as fools. They changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible things. They surround themselves like in that room, that inner door. You can just see Ezekiel 8 being unfolded here. With all these four-footed beasts, creeping things, therefore God gave them up to uncleanliness. They started to do it and it manifested in their hands. They are no longer a special people, holy, proclaiming these things, a model nation. No, they started proclaiming something else. Because in the lust of their hearts, they even dishonored their bodies among themselves. They exchanged the truth of God for the lie. They worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator. They weep for Tammuz. They worship Babylon. They turn their backs on me. They rather do that than me. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. And again, we start seeing just how far we would go in this progression when we turn our backs on God. We think about what Ezekiel was saying. We think about what Paul is saying here. We think about what we have in this honor. Are we getting this message as a congregation of God? Will we ever get to the point where we're insecure or weak in our own special and unique culture that we would want to reach out for what others have? We want to feel normal. You are normal because you are actually walking in a way that God created, created you to be in His image. To be his child. To be an example. To go be bringing you into glory. That's the normal line. Everything else is the abnormal. So he says, don't let that, that mindset get, in, get inside you. In fact, God so loves the world that he wants them to get it too. He sent his son so that all may live. He wants them to understand, you are the abnormal ones. You're the, you're the contrary. There is a way. You've got to look for that truth. No matter what seems popular, you've got to shed that thought. You've got to control that mind. You've got to protect that heart. You've got to keep those hands high. You know, Malachi says something that's very eye-opening. Malachi chapter 1. Malachi chapter 1, verse 6. You see, he says, A son honors his father. A servant honors his master. You see this in, in society. Well, we not, we're seeing that fall apart. But God says, If I am the father, where's my honor? Where is my honor? If I'm the master, where is my reverence? Then he says, To you priests who despise my name, yet you say, In what way have we despised your name? You offer defiled food on my altar, but you say, In what way have we defiled you? By saying, The table of the Lord is contemptible. And when you offer the blind as a sacrifice, is that not evil? When you offer the lame and sick, is that not evil? Offer it then to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept, your favor, accept you favorably? God says, entreat me now. 
and treat and think about who you are. Think about how it was all made possible. You're willing to reach outside the truth, the normal, and approach me by what they, the created, says is acceptable. You know some of the things you do won't fly in your own world, but you come before me. Because your mind is not focused on me. Your heart is not allowing my law to be written upon it. Your hands are filled with blood and defilement. That's why we have to be on guard. So this does not, we don't accept things like that. We don't want Satan to infiltrate us. We want to recognize what's taking place. We want to be on guard. We don't want, as we see, we see in Revelation chapter 3, God, well known, talks about that Laodicean attitude. Where he says, I'm rich, increased with goods, I'm, I'm, I'm okay. I, and God said, no, you're putting a blind sacrifice on this altar. In fact, you're the blind one. You're giving things that are defiled on my altar in your heart, and you're not getting it. You know, we're back here. Just turn, I'll turn there real quick. Hosea, Hosea 11, 7 says this. My people are bent on backsliding. Though they call to the Most High, they don't exalt Him. They do not exalt Him. In chapter 4, I think it's in verse 1, in the last part it says, There is no truth or mercy or knowledge of God in the land. In verse 6, because my people are destroyed by that lack of knowledge because they've actually rejected it. I was listening to a podcast of one of my favorite, one of my apologists I like to listen to is Paul Wasser. He goes, you know how this happens? We far too often like to dress up in the armor of Saul, but leave the stones that are needed to slay a giant behind. think we can do it ourselves. We trust in our own selves and forget to put our reverence toward our God. If we're not putting that first, when these end times come, will we be able to distinguish which white horse is Christ and which white horse is a false religion? They both will ride. Will we hear the message of the false two witnesses? the beast and the Antichrist, or we hear the message of the true two witnesses of our God. We got to think about these things. We got to remember the principles of who we are, how it was made possible. A people whose God is the only true God in heaven, who live by every word that proceeds out of his mouth. You can, in your own study, Go back and read Psalm 1. In whom delight is the law of God. You know, I read this before, but right before Britain entered into that war, Winston Churchill gave that famous speech called Hold the Line. Or their finest hour, excuse me. And I want to read that just in context here. Winston Churchill gave this speech on June 18th, 1940. And this is just a portion of it. He said, I expect that the battle of Britain is about to begin. Upon this battle depends the survival of Christian civilization. Upon it begins our own British life and the long continuity of our institutions and and of Europe, of our empire. The whole fury and might of the enemy must very soon be turned on us. Hitler knows that he will have to break us in this island or he will lose the war. If we can stand up to him, all Europe may be free and the life of the world may move forward into broad, sunlit uplands. But if we fail, then the world, the whole world, including the United States, including all that we have known and cared for, will sink into the dark abyss of a new age, made, made more sinister and perhaps more protracted by the lights of perverted science. Let us therefore brace ourselves to our duties and so bear ourselves that if the British Empire and its commonwealth last for a thousand years, men will say, this was their finest hour. 
How can that be said of us? That congregation of God stood true. They never gave up. Despite what the adversary threw against them. Despite what tried to infiltrate them. You see, when we thought they were at their demise, it became clear. They never turned their mind, their heart, their hand from their, their God. They stood firm. They were willing to stand in the gap for those who would walk after them. They had vision. They stayed in contact faithfully as a servant. It was indeed their finest hour. Will we continue to offer the sacrifices of praise? Will we allow the fruit of God's Spirit to continue to grow in our lives? If we want the fruit, we have to endure the pruning. We have to take the fertilizer. We have to take the nourishment. Do we hear the vine dresser? Are we submitting to the pruning? Could those words come through what we read in the beginning of this series in 1 Corinthians 13? I want to read that again. You don't have to turn there. I'm going to read it from God's perspective. As what we read in 1 John 4, 8, God is love. Could it be God saying, though I give you the ability to speak with the tongues of men and of angels, though I give you the gift of prophecy, the ability to understand all mysteries and knowledge, although I've given you, helped you get with the faith to remove mountains and are willing to use all that you have, you're willing to use all that you have to feed the poor. You're even willing to give your life for others. Do you remember something greater must be there first? Or it will profit you nothing. We don't want to hear, Lord, Lord, we did. But he goes, I never knew. Because he says this, love. Love is that greater thing. It's an outgoing, sacrificial way of life. And it must be the reason. It must be the true intent that fuels your desire to handle such powerful gifts and perform such sacrifices. Love is my nature. Love has to become your nature because I am love. I suffer long. I'm kind. I do not envy. I do not parade myself around in vanity. I'm not puffed up with pride. I do not pay, behave rudely. I don't selfishly seek out my own comforts. I'm not provoked to react inappropriately. I think no evil. I do not rejoice in iniquity, but I rejoice in the truth. I patiently endure all things. I put my trust in the things that are faithful. I have a hope with great expectation in those things. I remain. I abide. I endure all things because I am love. And I never fail. You want a definition of truth and love? There you have it. That is truth in love. That's God's identity. The very nature and character we're to emulate. We have to understand it. We have to adopt it. It has to be the default way we operate. It can't be used as an easy button. Do we believe it enough to look deep down inside of our hearts, our minds, and our hands and admit I could be wrong. I could be wrong at what I'm doing. I need to get back on track. It's going to take a lot. We've got to ask where the old paths, where the smooth way is. Seek. Seek that which God would desire of us. Final set of scriptures, Psalm 78. Psalm 78. Verse 1. 
Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. Verse 5. For he establishes a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers, that they should make them known. Not just to themselves. He gave it to them so that it's for a purpose, perpetual, so they can make it known to their children, that the next generation to come might know them. The children who would be born, that they may arise and declare them to their children, that they may set their hope in God. And not forget the works of God, but keep His commandments. And may not be like their fathers. A stubborn and rebellious generation. A generation that did not set its heart right. And whose spirit was not faithful to God. 1 John chapter 2. First John chapter 2, I'll just start reading in verse 5. But whoever keeps, keeps his word, truly love of God is perfected in him. But this we know that we are in him. By this we know that we're in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also walk just as he walked. Verse 15. Do not love the world or the things of this world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. If the world is passing away in the lust of it, and the world is passing away in the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. Verse 20. You have an anointing from the Holy One. You know all things. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know the truth, and that no lie is in your mouth. Verse 24. Therefore, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning, and what you heard from the beginning abides in you. You also will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that He has promised us, eternal life. These things I have written to you concerning those who try to deceive you. By the anointing which you have received from Him abides in you. But that anointing received is abiding in you, and you do not need that anyone teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things, and it is true, And it is not a lie. Just as it has been taught you, you will abide in him. And now, little children, abide in him. That when he appears, you may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. We should be willing to be different. We should accept the honor of what it means. To be different. We possess something so precious. If we live in the Spirit, as Paul said in Galatians 5 25, we're expected to walk in it. We didn't come here to be comfortable. We didn't come here to be filled, warm, and fuzzy inside. We came here to grow. And that's not always comfortable. We're not here for ourselves. We're here for something greater. We didn't come to be entertained. We didn't come to hear a motivational speech. We came to hear the word of God. Have it penetrate our heart. Words that set us apart. Words that give us life. The message we seek is not man-centered. The message we seek is God-centered. That's the only thing we want in our mind. Developing our hearts. Revealed in our hands. That indeed makes us a peculiar people. A very special people. A chosen people. Not hiding in the dark. But servants. Humble servants. Learning to walk boldly in a world that we're not part of. Giving hope to those who will follow after us. Giving hope to our children. Showing that there is a way. Fighting against the culture. Fighting against our own human nature. Fighting against synchronization with the world. Synchronizing is not acceptable to us. We are not just another congregation in Babylon. We've been called. We've been gathered. We've assembled here by our sovereign God. 
because we are the ecclesia. We are the church that Christ built. Do we love it? Do we love each other? Do we sigh and cry when it's threatened? Are we doing our part? Do we consider the mind, the heart, and the hand? If we truly respect our God, His Son, this church, His Sabbath, this assembly, the truth, let us therefore conduct ourselves in a such way. Let us seek with our entire heart, mind, and strength to be that holy congregation of God.